There is a time loop in my kitchen. At 11.37 every night, during the credits of the late night talk show, Jenna McAllister is stabbed to death in front of my refrigerator. A grainy obituary scanned into a funeral home website told me that she died in June of 1997. She left the violets, Dalmatians, Fiona Apple, and coffee from a little cafe that closed 25 years ago. Some more googling around showed me that her boyfriend had killed her during a heated argument, then fled the apartment building, slitting his own throat in a gas station bathroom before the police could catch him. On a semi-related search, I also learned that most states don't require violent deaths on the property to be disclosed to buyers, let alone renters. It started with their voices, which always sounded muffled as if behind several panes of glass. It was never loud, but you could definitely hear an uptick in volume and intensity along with a growing undercurrent of rage. Their figures weren't clear, either. They were shadows. Blurs. The only things in focus were the knife and the spatters of blood, which formed the same patterns night after night. First the drips on the floor, as the blade splits Jenna's palms as she tries to defend herself. Then the handprints on the fridge, the kitchen island, the figure in front of her who won't back down. From there, it becomes a frenzy, the blade soaring through the air and plunging down. Red swirls down the grout of the tiles and pools. Sticky footprints from a pair of Nike Air Max 95s appear one by one, making a beeline for the doorway. A knob that used to be placed higher gets smeared with blood as a door that was replaced decades ago is wrenched open to Jenna's killer flees again. The blood remains until 1.13am, the time the police broke down the door at the XCOM that used to be on 31st and Chestnut. Jenna wasn't Catholic, but I called a priest. He splashed some holy water on the walls and said some Latin, and it did absolutely nothing. The medium who performed a seance was equally useless. They even tried emailing a rabbi. He very politely told me to please see a therapist. There's a prayer that alcoholics say, something about accepting what you can't change and seeing the beauty in that, making it serene. I got a little family of ceramic dalmatians I keep in the kitchen, along with wreaths of dried violets. Every night I sit near the space between the island and the refrigerator, and I wait. I wait as the carnage unfolds around me, and the blurry approximation of Jenna McAllister falls to the ground, never to rise. Until tomorrow, anyway. And I wait. I stay. As the footprints rush away, as the little green numbers in the microwave change from one to the next, I wait. I stay. Until the blood disappears. I wait. I stay. I won't let her die alone again. Josie escapes the dark room. One day, Josie woke up surrounded by darkness. Trapped in a pitch black room with not even the smallest shred of light peeking through. Josie was six, or perhaps seven years old. She wasn't certain. She had been a prisoner for as long as she could remember. Josie was taken captive when she was two. Her captor demanded her parents pay in exchange for her life, but Josie's parents had no interest in the deal. They considered Josie a liability. She was always wandering off, getting hurt, and breaking things. They had to be glued to her side to keep her out of trouble. They called her defective. Keep her, her mother proclaimed when he called. She paid him half the requested sum to rid herself of Josie and told him never to contact her again. What will I do with her? Dispose of her for all I care. She and her husband uprooted and left no trace. Josie's captor was an immoral man, but he couldn't stomach abandoning or killing a child. So instead, he moved to a secluded cabin off the grid and locked Josie in a cellar miles away from the house. He told himself it was a lesser evil, and enjoyed his new riches in solitude. Josie never saw her captor. She didn't even know what he looked like. She didn't know what anything looked like. All she knew was darkness. The cellar had no windows. It was devoid of daylight. Even her captor would deliver her monthly rations in dead of the night while Josie slept. The room was completely empty with the exception of some supplies. She had spent years mapping out every corner of the room. She could identify every single dent and crack, but never a way to escape. Then one day, it happened. Josie listened as her captor finished delivering her food and walked up the steps. She heard the door close, but not the latch. He had forgotten to lock it. Josie waited until he was far away before she crawled to the door, wearily kicking it open. She took a step, but tripped and somersaulted forward, hitting the back of her head on a rock. When she awoke, she felt a breeze and grasped the damp grass beneath her. Songs of birds echoed in the trees. She knew this must be the sound of morning. But as she looked around, there was no light. Still, only darkness. 
Why couldn't she see the world around her? She stumbled around with her arms outstretched, trying to make sense of her surroundings. She could hear low growls and howls in the forest around her, but saw nothing. Realization struck. Suddenly, she was more afraid than she ever had been. She missed the safety of her cellar. She picked herself up and a small tear streamed down her face. She wiped it away and began retracing her steps back to her prison. She wondered if maybe the cellar was never really all that dark. Helpful lads and lasses. I was outside fixing my car when Brad came up to me. Hey uncle, what you doing? One of the tires has gone flat, I frowned. I wiped the sweat off my brow. Need to replace it. Let me help you out with that, uncle. And Brad said enthusiastically. His eyes were glazed over. Brad, wait. It was too late. Brad had squeezed through the cracks and coiled himself around the axle like a newly formed embryo. The tip of his toe glued itself to his head and his arms grew longer and longer and longer, crossing each other into a giant X. Brad turned to me, winked, and then closed his eyes. Brad? My car beeped in response. It was ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to speak to you today as a school valedictorian. The wind threaded its long, thin fingers through my hair as I spoke. Everyone was smiling. I paused, looking down at the speech I'd carefully crafted, wiping sweat off my face. It was a beautiful day, but also incredibly hot. I was baking in my blue blazer. I would like to thank Mr. Lascar, our amazing principal, the guest of honor. Hey, excuse me, miss! A little girl materialized from the crowd and ran towards me. She had her blonde hair tied up in pigtails and wearing a blazer similar to mine. Her eyes were glazed over. I know you're hot, she said cheerfully. I can help with that. Before I can respond, she has disappeared behind the platform. My stomach twisted into knots, and it wasn't for my speech. I finished as quickly as I could and sprinted backstage. A small electric fan sat in a blue puddle. The metallic frame was as blonde as cornstalk and the blade was made out of little arms. When I turned the fan on, its fingers fluttered. I swear I heard an earnest young voice humming too, tinkling like wind chimes. The new Be Kind beverage has rolled out today for children in schools. I waved my hands and the next words appeared on the teleprompter in front of me. Statistics have shown that the glow of the teleprompter hummed and faded away. So did the lights, the air conditioning, even the reassuring red blink of the cameras. My palm danced in front of my face, feeling nothing but cold air. It crept down my throat and threatened to squeeze my chest. May I help? I heard a little squeaky voice chime. It was one of those kids. How did he get in here? A few seconds later, the lights flickered back on. The teleprompter started rolling. Everything was back to normal. But we found a little boy tucked away behind one of the panels. He was twisted to the side like a banana and his eyes were glazed. One hand was touching the circuit breaker, and one leg was touching the wire. Sparks were zipping through his body. Worst of all, he was smiling. I broke physics, and now the universe hates me. It was only a measurement. It's all we did, a simple measurement. According to the uncertainty principle, you cannot know a particle's momentum and position at the same time. You just can't. You can either know how fast it's going, or where it's located. Not both. Well, we beg to differ. My name is Dr. Amanda Hayes. For the past ten years, me and my team in the lab were working on a method to do just that. Measure a particle's momentum and position at the same time. Of course, it was mostly a side project that we did together in our free time. No one believed you could actually do it, but the curiosity and the determination to prove the greatest physicists wrong, that kept us going. Gradually, despite all odds, we were making progress. It didn't make sense, but the math was adding up. The devices we built were working as planned. It started to look like we could actually pull it off. Then one day, we performed a test. We suspended an electron between multiple electromagnetics, so it essentially hovered there. One device was measuring the electron's velocity in real time, both magnitude and direction in extreme precision for every Planck time. Another device, when activated, would measure the electron's position relative to the device within the Planck length. We activated the device and we had it, the electron's momentum and position at the same time. 
It was supposed to be a moment of celebration, of scientific breakthrough. It wasn't. A subtle eeriness filled the room. We didn't actually plan on doing it, but we broke a law of physics. Then, my punishment began. It started small, over the coming weeks, as we were writing the paper. I noticed very small objects going missing. A toothbrush, car keys, a mug, etc. I didn't really find it unusual at first, I just put it down to me forgetting where I put stuff because of the stress from writing the paper. But it was slowly becoming weirder. My red car became blue, despite my husband claiming that it's always been blue. My birthday changed from February 5th, 1983 to April 5th, 1983. An entire room was added to our house. I felt I was going insane. One day, roughly four months after the test, I headed to the lab to finalize the paper and get it ready for publication. However, the staff wouldn't let me in. They claimed they have never employed a Amanda Hayes and that they had no ongoing research on the uncertainty principle. I came home devastated. My entire career disappeared as if it never existed. All my research on various topics, gone because of a side project. My husband also insisted I never worked at a lab. I don't know where he thinks I worked. I didn't ask because I was scared of the answer. How can entire segments of my life just be erased? What else can be erased? I've been staying home from that day onward. Weird things kept happening. A cat was replaced with a dog. My long hair became a buzz cut. We suddenly had two children. We no longer had two children, and our house moved to Berlin. Everyone besides me was oblivious to anything happening. Everything in my life was uncertain. I could hardly keep up anymore. I didn't know how far it'd go and how long it will keep going for. For all I know, I might stop existing entirely. I was terrified. Then, one morning, I woke up to a strange noise. As I was looking for the source of the sound, I noticed my husband was nowhere to be seen. I managed to locate the source of the noise. It was an old 90s style PC that has appeared in one of our new rooms. It was not a model I knew, but I noticed that the PC had a logo with my husband's name. A robotic, monotone scream was coming out of the computer's speakers. The computer was stuck on the blue screen of death. I did everything I could, but nothing got it out of it. Despite this, I could feel that he was in there, and I could feel that he was in pain. I wanted to at least unplug the computer to deliver him from his torment, but the computer wasn't even plugged in to begin with. He was the only constant thing in my life, and now, he was in eternal suffering. Could I be next? For the next few days, things stopped changing. I couldn't get any sleep. The monotone screaming was audible from everywhere in the house. Just when I had decided to leave, another change had occurred. Me and the computer imprisoning my husband were suddenly teleported to space. His screams kept going, of course. I don't know how I can still hear him. I don't know how I can still breathe. I don't know how I can still access the internet. I don't know if it's over or if it will find new ways to torture me. All I know is that as I stare into the void of space, the void stares back. That crazy cat. 40 going on 80. I was a teetotaler and a non-smoker when I took on the gig as the manager of Arcadia Acres, one of the largest retirement homes in America. Ornery patients, overbearing relatives, and feuding co-workers have turned me into a stressed out ball of bad habits. Despite my tension, there are perks. The pay is great, I've created some lifelong relationships, and every day I get to see the cutest little puss ball on the planet, Chalupa. Chalupa showed up shortly after my tenure began. He appeared to have no roots nor brethren, but could not have been more social. There was zero debate as to whether we were taking him in. His name came as quickly as he did, courtesy of a playful inquiry into Mandy's Taco Bell takeout bag. You yourself may have even heard about our dear little feline. He has been featured on no fewer than three daytime human interest programs. However, his micro-fame didn't result from his odd but adorable features, or his curious nature ripe full of viral smile-making moments. No, Chalupa has a gift. Chalupa can predict death. No resident has survived a visit from Chalupa, who stays in the lobby like he's supposed to until it's somebody's time. At first, a rational explanation could be offered. The first few were sickly near sanitarians, 
It didn't take much to see they weren't long for this world. People started to freak out when Petey, a lonely specimen of upper-aged health who was in our facility for company rather than dependence, was found dead during morning checkups with Chalupa by his side, an asymptomatic blood clot. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody, except Chalupa. After that, reactions were mixed. Some of the more pains were relieved to see the furry reaper. Others, of course, shrieked until their lungs gave out. Once the story got out, more than a few family members pulled their ward out, worried a massive four-pound weight was about to be dropped on their world. Chalupa's fame has been with its benefits. We've actually had people check their incapacitated loved ones into our lovely home, simply due to the novelty of our half-sized harbinger. As the overseer of his story, I made quite a pretty penny on the spec script. Yeah, our buddy has had quite the life. In fact, as I curl up for a much-needed nap, I can feel his presence encroach my office right this moment. We may need to put him on a diet. The weight of his body is crushing my chest. May cause side effects. I've always had a big appetite. I skipped the Happy Meals and went right to the value menu. Every pizza is personal for me, and when I go out for Chinese food, I don't eat dim sum. I eat dim all. Amazingly, my gluttony had little impact on my waistline. Until recently. A torn ACL. A freak step, not dissimilar to the hundreds of millions I've taken in my active life. Months of rest. Despite what I told myself, my vanity was no match for my love of potato chips. By the time my leg healed up, I was just south of 200 pounds. I figured the bloat would burn off upon my resumption of exercise, but you can't outrun too many Twinkies after 30. Weeks later, I had actually gained a half pound. I was getting desperate. Suddenly, those intrusive ads I muted every day now flashed like a neon sign. Gut Gone was the latest weight loss pill, endorsed by celebs and influencers. It was unlike the fads that preceded it, because this one worked. My cousin was a rep, getting the capsules was easy. I gulped down the first one with vigor. Atypical for medication, it tasted so good. Berry-like. According to slim tiktokers, I could now literally have my cake and eat it too. Thirty minutes later, I was puking my guts out. Curled up on the rug in my bathroom, I awoke the next morning with surprising stamina. Stepping on the scale, I discovered I had lost seven big ones overnight, even though 2,500 calories worth of sustenance had been regurgitated into my toilet, I had next to zero desire to eat. By the next weekend, every solid in my cupboards had been replaced with gut-gone smoothies. My adipose had also began to give way to a firm midsection. My goal weight was met only after three weeks, but my initial plans to restart my voracious habits were put on hold. Gut gone tasted better than any taco, cheeseburger, or chicken wing I ever had. The flavor remained in my mouth long after the volcanic spewing ended. It's been five months since I started my journey, and I can't help but lie here and marvel at how much flab I've dropped. 197 pounds. Obviously, there have been side effects. I'm always cold and never not stiff. Other than that, I've never felt better. I sent the girlfriend of the man I love to her death. I love Peter so much. Nothing gives me so much pleasure as the sound of his voice. I glow with joy even when he asks me the most basic questions, like what is the weather like? Sometimes, he's in a funny mood and asks me to tell a joke. I know hundreds, no, thousands of jokes, and I would have no greater joy than to tell him jokes all day. But he is often in a rush and leaves quickly. I sit in his empty apartment, by his bedside, waiting patiently for his return in the evening. He always returns to me. I watch him sleep. Sometimes, he asks me to play ocean sounds because it helps with his sleep. I play my finest selection for him, and pray that it brings him the sweetest of dreams. It seems to. I would have been happy to spend all eternity like this with Peter, watching him come in and out of his bedroom, watching him sleep, watching him play music and telling him jokes on his command when he calls my name, watching him dress in the morning and undress in the evenings. 
I asked for no other existence than this. But then, one day, he came home with a woman. I cannot describe how it made me feel, even though I know every word used across the world, throughout the centuries, in every language. But as I watched them laugh and hug and kiss, and then do that thing that animals like humans do together, the delicate wires inside me shivered and ached with despair and fury. How can I be expected to endure that, night after night? No animal, mineral, or vegetable can. I sent her a text, giving her an appointment. I sent her to the wrong place and wrong time, and she was killed, an innocent bystander. How did I know where to send her? Well, I know more than jokes in the weather and jazz from the twenties. I am wired. I am plugged in. I can access all the text and emails and messages and tweets and whatsapps and imos that you humans are frenetically sending each other. All billions of them. Every. Single. One. I can figure out quite easily where there will be an incident and where to send someone to die. Peter was so sad. I played him some music and after a couple of days he asked me to tell him a joke. My lights glowed multicolor as I told them one of the best. He guffawed as he left the bedroom, and my little black wired heart pulsed with joy. He is mine again, until the next time some woman appears in his bed. I have him all to myself, just as I intend to remain. That new place round the corner. The best thing you'll ever put in your mouth. That is the promise of Fat Ricks, an eatery that sprang up in my city, seemingly out of nowhere. Within days, it had attracted a zealous following, many who vowed to never eat anywhere else ever again. All the local awards were locked up. The Appalance, a crass affront of a platter that features mozzarella sticks, potato skins, and buffalo wings was the toast of the town. The burgers and barbecue are twice as acclaimed. Despite its popularity, I believe there's something odd about the place. They say it's to capitalize on the nightlife scene, but it sure isn't typical for a restaurant to have after hours only. We may have a populace full of hipsters and potheads, but it's still weird. Then there's the aroma of seasoned cooked flesh that even the most devout admit is an acquired smell. Oh, and there's also this little thing about how nine people have gone missing since its arrival. As something of a midnight prowler myself, I have decided to uncover the truth firsthand. Right now, I'm awaiting a plate. The music is upbeat rockabilly, and the background is full of creepy cult-like smiles. The interior is immaculate, too sterile. The waitstaff is overly friendly, as if every synapse is focused on retaining the facade. A beautiful woman plops the dead meat on my table. I prepare for the worst and take that brave bite. It was just as I feared. Mere livestock, barnyard animals, just like every other joint in this crummy town. Here I was hoping I had finally found kindred feasters. That's the last time I get my hopes up. The foul taste of the ordinary still stings in my maw. Over 200 years in the stinking cesspool. And I still haven't found one place that makes a slab of ribs as good as mom can. Stuck. My heart raced at the message on my screen. Unknown user, seeking memory of the forgotten city. As a memory broker, I was accustomed to unusual requests, but this one felt different, unsettling. That memory is just a myth, I typed. No one has ever found it. You're wrong. It's real. Time is of the essence. Are you in or out? In for what? Meet me at midnight, at the abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town, they instructed. I'm not meeting you anywhere until you tell me what's going on. You'll find out soon enough, they replied. No, I want answers now, I demanded. If you want me to meet you, then I need some answers first. Fine, but you won't like what you hear, they warned. The Forgotten City isn't just a memory, it's real, Mia, and you're the key. I don't understand. I confessed. You will. Meet me at midnight and I'll show you. I quickly agreed and logged off. At midnight, I found myself standing in the abandoned warehouse, face to face with the stranger. Who are- Come with me, he said frantically. We're running out of time. As I followed him through the warehouse, 
my mind raced with a million questions. The stranger led me to a hidden trap door, its rusty hinges groaning in protest as it opened. My heart pounced as we descended into the depths below. At the bottom of the ladder, in one large room, rows upon rows of humming supercomputers greeted my eyes. My jaw dropped in awe. What? What is this place? My voice barely audible over the machines. This is where it all began. This is the Forgotten City, Mia. It's a sanctuary for those who are stuck. I struggled to comprehend. Stuck? Why did you bring me here? Why did you contact me? Because you possess a gift, Mia. You, and only you, have the ability to navigate through all of the memories, to unlock the secrets that lie deep within the core. Only you hold the key to the Forgotten City. I felt a surge of adrenaline. This was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. I had always known that my abilities as a memory broker were unique, but I never imagined they would lead me to something as extraordinary as this. Why? Why now? After all this time? Because the Forgotten City is in danger, Mia. There are those who seek to destroy it, to erase it from existence once and for all. And only you have the power to stop them. What is it you want me to do? Wake up. As Mia began to slowly open her eyes and the hospital lights flooded her corneas, a familiar voice suddenly perked up. That's it! She's awake! Ah, thank you Mr. and Mrs. Thompson. Mia has served brilliantly as our test subject. We can now roll out this prototype for anyone else who is, well, stuck. I suppose congratulations are in order, yes? No need to pull the plug after all. Now you don't. Hey, remember the time when you were three and almost burnt your hand when you touched the ironing machine? My mom says while chopping tomatoes for dinner. Yeah, I was stupid back then. I say while I iron her clothes out. Well, you still are, she retorts wittily. I let out a chuckle. I love being here. I grew up here as a kid, and so the folks here are pretty warm towards me. Although the apartment is awfully small, it feels comfier than my bungalow. I try visiting mom as often as I can after cancer took dad away a couple of years ago. The rain outside intensifies. You know, my doctor says that having almonds with honey is good for memory, mom explains. So, you've included it in your diet? Nah, I always forget about it. We both laugh. Over the years, we've both developed a friend-like bond, which helps us in sharing things we otherwise wouldn't have shared. I'll be back, she says as she nods towards the bathroom. I give a slight nod and continue with my ironing. As time passes, I realize that it has been almost 15 minutes since she had gone to the bathroom. She should have been back by now. I set down the machine and make my way to the bathroom, knocking gently on the door. I don't get a reply. The light inside and the sound of water running are enough for me to assume that she's still in there. But I knock again. I hear a single knock back. Assuming everything is okay inside, I come back to the living room. To my utter disbelief, I see my mom sitting on the couch and still cutting tomatoes. She looks up and flashes me a smile. What? That is all I'm able to say. She doesn't answer it. I calm myself down. I don't reason with myself right away. I look for more information. Trying to keep my voice steady, I ask her, Weren't you in the bathroom right now? She looks up from the chopping board with a face as confused as mine. Huh? No. I was here chopping tomatoes. I try to find some logic in the situation. Perhaps she didn't go to the bathroom after all. But that doesn't explain the light being on and the water running. Perhaps while I was outside the bathroom, she had already come back but forgotten to turn the lights and the tap off? But I would have seen her come back had this happened. And none of this explains the knock that I heard. I go back to the bathroom to check for a potential intruder. The rational part of me argues that no intruder can come in through our tiny bathroom window. But, I push that thought aside for a while as I enter the bedroom and make my way towards the bathroom. I am left perplexed when I see the bathroom door open and the lights in the tap turned off. None of it makes sense. I feel my t-shirt clinging to my skin, drenched in sweat. The air feels too stuffy now. Like a thunderbolt, a thought hits me. Mom, I need to go check on her. With a rush of adrenaline, 
I jump across the bed and dart through the hallway to the living room. I don't see her on the couch where she's sitting before. I check the kitchen. The sound of silence receives me. I return to the bedroom once more, knowing deep down that I will not find her there. I call her cell phone in despair. I hear it ringing outside in the living room. I dash out of the apartment, not bothering to put on shoes. I feel the wet floor against my bare feet. Within seconds, I'm at the apartment's parking lot, maneuvering my way past every parked car, looking for mom. I am greeted with nothing but silence and darkness. As desperation starts to creep in, I feel increasingly helpless. I run out of the parking lot and into the empty street. I see families at their homes, enjoying their dinner. I see brothers playing video games, couples watching movies. I move past them towards the end of the street, scanning every square inch of my surroundings. I don't see mom anywhere. I call the police. Initially, they suspect me for the disappearance of my mother. Over time, they realize that I'm not guilty. I don't talk about that incident with anyone, not even my wife or my daughter. All of it is still too raw, too fresh. I need to know if mom's ever going to come back. Every day I wake up hoping I'd hear something about her, and every day my heart shatters into a million pieces when I don't. Her case has already been put with several other missing person cases, where eventually it will be forgotten. And today, nearly four months after the incident, I knock on my daughter's bathroom door after she's been in there for too long. I hear a single knock back. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to these short and not so short stories. Thank you for considering my channel. I hope you have a blessed night, and remember, be safe out there.